Professor Calder is the director of the Raishawa Center for East Asian Studies and also of the Japan Studies and Asia Program uh, at the Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies, SAIUS. And mm -hmm. I'm very proud to mention that he was also the 2016 Roger Anam Professor of Strategic Studies at, mm. at RSIS. So uh, mm. we are particularly pleased to welcome you, Ken, back to Thank Singapore you. once again. Good to be here. Now, I trust that Ken uh, won't mind this observation, uh, but you know, when someone presumes to write a book on Singapore and, <laughs> you know, uh, uses words like smart and number one, and, and, and then the book is then launched right here, of all places, in Singapore. You got to wonder, you know, what's what's going on, and you know, and you know, you know what I'm saying, right? You know? uh, <laughs> however, I, I I'm very pleased to it's note true. that um, Ken's book, uh, uh, Ken has produced, I think, in my view, an outstanding book uh, that only a scholar of the exceptional caliber and authority of Kent uh, can produce, uh, free of of gratuitous encomium um, and and uh, that's normally associated with works of of this nature. I think what Ken has produced. Uh, is a clear eye balanced assessment of Singapore's very pragmatic survival uh, and, and uh, uh, success. Uh, he has, with great care, I think, and with all the appropriate qualifications, presented Singapore uh, as a model worthy of emulation by developing and developed states alike. Um, he has managed to accomplish all of this without pulling any punches on the downsides, both small and big, um, of Singapore's uh, uh, performance oriented logics and, and, and legitimacy. So much remains to be said, and here I think we have the benefit of Ken's introduction, and also uh, uh, followed by a review by my colleague, uh, Tech Boon, uh, and then of course we'll open up the floor to, uh, to a dialogue uh, with, with Kent on, on the book. So please join me now in just welcoming Kent once again, Professor Calder. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you very much. It's a real pleasure to be uh, back uh, in Arsis in Singapore and, and also under the aegis of Arsis here. Uh, my uh, time uh, last year as Rajaratnam professor was, uh, I learned a tremendous amount. I enjoyed it. I appreciate uh, the friendship, the discussions that we did. and. It was really one of the honors of, of my career. All of that said, I, I should say uh, from the very outset, I, uh, while I have actually since I first visited at, I guess, uh, nine years old, the first time I came through uh, Singapore, um, you know, I've come back over the years time and time again. I've never done any consulting at all that had anything to do with Singapore. I've never, apart from the Rajaratnam professorship that came uh, when the book was pretty much done, you know, I'd never had that sort of a, a engagement, uh, offer support, anything like this. This really has, to, it flows from a particular uh, set of experiences and a particular set of feelings about uh, Singapore itself. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think there's no question, I mean, that you are a, a rather, a very, very unusual uh, place uh, that has uh, significance in many different ways for the broader world. And those are the sorts of questions that I wanted to explore. I've been, been cautioned by several of you uh, in this room, some of those who are right in front of us. Don't be too euphoric. Don't uh, overstate this case. Uh, you know, see it in, in a broad range of different contexts. And that certainly is what I have tried to do. There's a section specifically called uh, Shadows. Um, and th the whole question of the future, is th the future analogous to the past? You know, that's a question, certainly, uh, that I'm conscious of. Maybe I should say a word uh, at, at the outset of really what I was intending uh, here first, and then a little bit about how I became interested, and then I just briefly like to summarize. I had just a few 
uh, slides, these often be a crutch. So I thought before I get into the slides, I'd probably better uh, talk about these broader, more uh, conceptual uh, points up front. Uh, I had some discussions with uh, friends uh, from uh, several public policy schools, the Wilson School at Princeton, where I taught for 20 years, uh, from the Kennedy School at Harvard, where I taught for uh, four years, um, and also from some of my colleagues at SAIS, about the idea of case studies and best practice. Uh, obviously, in the case, and, and I think it's fair to say that uh, while in the world of business schools, that case studies probably, even though they've been central, I think especially at Harvard Business School, you know, for many, many years, um, there's some rebellion against that in the business world. Wharton doesn't use them as much, for example. But uh, in public policy, I think that's a much newer uh, notion. And my objective here in trying to distill a few ideas out of uh, Singapore public policy that I thought had a broader reference and broader relevance was to, um, to address that issue of evocative cases that might have some sort of broader relevance. It's not obvious that they're relevant all over the world or that they're relevant in all sort of policy areas. Uh, some of them may be relevant uh, at the local level. Um, the book itself is titled Smart City, Smart State. And I think particularly in the case of Singapore, a lot of the most judge broadly relevant uh, uh, paradigms flow from uh, you know the way that you conduct uh, urban management, even as a nation state, a city state, but the way that you uh, deal with problems that uh, cities uh, across the world, that particularly in the developing world, may need to deal with. I remember I was here for HPAIR, uh, some the Harvard. A s student program, when was this? Maybe five years, five or six years ago, just as I was starting uh, this project. And the president at that time of the club was uh, an architect. And he said, in the next 30 years, there's going to be 100 cities like Singapore uh, d being built across the developing world, China, India, Indonesia, you know, many of them in our very neighborhood. And he paused a minute and he said, well, and we're going to build them. So that's one sort of level at which uh, I think there's a question of where is Singapore relevant and where is it not in an urban transition, uh, which is historic, which is going on uh, now, only even in, across Asia with all the urbanization of the last couple of uh, generations, still 40% or 48% urban, something like that. Africa is only 40% urban now. Uh, Latin America is still undergoing this. So, you know, that's sort of one realm of relevance. The uh, transportation policies, the public security policies, the public health policies, the the holistic approach that relates all of those things uh, to one another. That's one level at which one can think about um, the relevance of Singapore uh, more generally. And, you know, other people are trying this too. Uh, I just came from Tokyo, and the Hitachi, for example, thinks that they're quite relevant to the city planning and mass transportation and those issues. And I think they have been, from what I understand, been working with Singapore in certain ways. Just to take one example, uh, the Koreans are fast in, in your footsteps. Uh, in port development, uh, Changi and Incheon Airport, of course, are neck and neck is the best and the second best by various um, pr uh, parameters, airports in the world. So uh, there are, you know, many things at that sort of micro level that I think one can look at that I'll go into more specifics later. Another set of issues, uh, these 
or some there things that were raised. Uh, for example, Micklethwaite, who was the editor of The Economist for years and who's now over at Bloomberg, he's been interested in this. Uh, it's another um, range of questions that are more macro. The relevance of Singapore's case for the G7. And I w wouldn't say that even obviously the c other country, those countries are larger and at the macro level as opposed to sort of the city planning level and so on that I'm talking about. Um, you know, that's a more uh, debatable question. And some of this relates to the set of values that one has about how you know, public policy should be constructed. What is the value of an opportunity-oriented approach as opposed to entitlement if one uh, just believes that in entitlements by their nature are things that human beings deserve as, as human beings. So that's one particular uh, set of approaches. And, you know, I think Singapore in some ways has addressed that, has accepted that in certain ways, but also with the constraint of resources and so on uh, being there and has, but there's some some elements that it seems to me are also quite relevant and some uh, particular uh, contemporary relevance as we face the crisis of resources in welfare states and some of the, on the one hand conservative and on the other hand populist, some combination of the two, the evolution of, of policy in the industrialized uh, world as well. Uh, there are some, you know, important areas, I think, approach to welfare, approach to health care, uh, approach, and I think even the, uh, the Trump administration could take some elements in, in two areas, uh, foreign direct investment. Um, the new appointee, likely appointee for ambassador to Tokyo, for example, has been head of the Tennessee Development Authority and is very much concerned with attracting foreign investment uh, into the U.S. And Trump, uh, pres President-elect Trump talks about jobs and such issues. Well, in terms of if you take EDB, if you take a range of, um, of uh, parameters like that, it seems to me both institutionally and in terms of actual policy outputs, Singapore has been quite successful in directing, uh, in, in encouraging incoming investment and the ways through which it has done those sort of things could, could have uh, broader relevance. The one area that I particularly uh, I want to talk about that, it, uh, is that I do think has some broader, <laughs> it has relevance both in the uh, G7 and in developing countries is the whole question of, of the role of housing in, in public policy. And to me, if there's one single thing that jumped out at me uh, as a creative uh, insight that has much broader relevance and that has endured over time and to the future that we will see as important uh, element of public policy uh, globally is to, to focus on housing and um, and on ownership of housing by individuals rather than uh, simply the approach that we for a long time adopted of, of public housing, but without uh, the stake in society, almost a cl classical Lockean stake in society that's created uh, when uh, housing is in, in people's uh, own hands that they own, to think about how to give them that kind of a stake in society uh, and then to to encourage housing to be a cornerstone of broader public policies, be it more stability in uh, communal relations, in ethnic relations, more stability in the community or in, in politics, uh, a, 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 a social a form of social security that then allows you to le rely less on the entitlements that have become so central and also so crippling 
in the uh, public policies of uh, many of the welfare states of the West. Um, so, so there's a, a series of, of policy-specific or area-specific uh, ideas um, that I decided to focus on uh, in this book. It's not, well, Singapore is relevant to all countries in, in all respects, and um, it's really a question of presenting some evocative cases that hopefully have some broader relevance that can be applied in a more uh, partial sort of way. Um, there's another level at which, I, a more global level, I, that I was trying to approach this as well. Um, the notion of, glo you know, lessons for the broader world that transcend uh, both the developing countries and, and uh, uh, G7. Um, your approach to globalism, it's not terribly fashionable in the, in the era of Brexit and Trump, as much so as it, as it was, you know, six months ago. But I think still uh, there are a lot of uh, supporters elsewhere in the world. Uh, and uh, these ideas uh, will come back from, from where they, they stand now. Um, the idea of places that can serve as a global hub or a global convening point for dialogues on issues of broader importance. Uh, for example, International Water Week. The story which you have, to me, it, it's really a remarkable story that, uh, you know, you basically, you know, you have close to six million people in such a s small place, uh, and you don't have mountains or rivers or things like that, but you become progressively closer to self-sufficient in supply of water, even though you produce integrated circuits and um, there's an industrial need for water and then there's all those people in such a crowded area. So how does that happen? And what is the broader relevance of that? You, with International Water Week, you bring people t here, one of the best airlines in the world, the number one uh, airport in the world, so convening has some built-in advantages, but you bring them from, all, from across the world uh, to look at those kind of global issues. And you've brought many international universities, our own, you know, we're in the healthcare area, we're interested in looking at some possible cooperations. You brought Berkeley here on energy-related issues. You have Tsinghua, you have Oxford and Cambridge, you, you have uh, MIT on uh, transportation. And uh, so this kind of global con convening function um, and then becoming a global laboratory, and then applying those ideas uh, much more broadly uh, across the world. Um, so there's various ideas, that are various levels at which one can conceive of, uh, of the lessons that one has here. Um, as I say, some of them I think are general. They relate to this broad, globalization that has, uh, has moved so rapidly since the 1970s uh, across the world. Uh, there's others that relate to this epic uh, urbanization transformation, particularly that's hitting the development, developing world the last maybe 20 years or so. Um, and then uh, some you know, that relate to this crisis of the welfare state and some of the problems that the advanced industrial nations have. So those are what I would say, and that doesn't, hasn't left me with very much time to sort of show you, but l maybe let me just uh, flip through a few slides and, and show you uh, sort of some of the graphics from the book itself in the hope that, you know, this might give you a little better sense of what I'm trying to do, and I look forward to, uh, to comments. Um, I think... If, if I had to pick 
One thing that interested me in looking across uh, Singapore policies, uh, and uh, I mean, there's, I do look at di sort of diplomatic and geopolitical questions as well as some of the things that I'm talking about here, but is the fact that the world has been changing so dramatically in the last uh, 30 or 40 years, I would say, particularly since the mid-1970s when globalization began to uh, move so rapidly. And uh, you've been really right at the heart of that in, you know, with Indonesia, China, India uh, as major neighbors with across the Strait of Malacca, through which 85% of Japan's oil, uh, most uh, uh, half, well, close to that, I guess, of, Ch well, not, not quite, maybe over half of China's oil flows. Uh, so a very strategic location, but also that's been at the center of a lot of these huge global changes uh, that have been occurring. Um, in s now, what has happened in that? Of I mean, one thing that's happened, of course, is, and this is more sort of an, out, an output rather than a, a cause, but, uh, you know, per capita income rose very sharply recently, I know, in the last year or two, and especially if you denominate in dollars with the dollar strengthening, there's a, you know, this has been blunted slightly, but that doesn't uh, gainsay just the dramatic changes that have occurred, particularly as you, as you can see sort of from here, roughly from the time of 9-11 uh, in the last 15 years, of course, there was a, a major uh, shift. Uh, you've been through many, many different, ad adapt adapting in many, many different ways toward uh, knowledge intensive industry, in some respects following uh, what happened in Japan uh, earlier, uh, but more service oriented, obviously. One thing that, of course, was very striking to me, and, um, this left an impression on me because the, I came here first w at nine years old, uh, you know, before independence. And uh, r I remember, and then uh, being back here during the Vietnam War years, uh, of course, there is a period in Singapore history that was not very stable in the early portions, the communal conflict and so on, uh, strikes. And of course, we're in a very different era now. Early phase challenges. Uh, the Vietnam War, when you became independent in 1965, the U.S. intervention in Vietnam uh, was just beginning. Um, income inequality, among others, I think, is certainly, but of course, we that has been rising in, in Singapore and, and is high, but of course in the United States. That's a problem. That's a problem throughout uh, the major industrialized nation, uh, nations of the world. Um, I, I have to say, uh, if I were to pick uh, five people on, the, on one, one hand, people who really, I think, transformed the, the 20th century or played far-sighted roles in, roles in the 20th century and even into the 21st, I think I and I dare say many of the rest of us here would have to say that uh, Lee Kuan Yew certainly would be among them, together with Deng Xiaoping and uh, a very small a number of others. Um, that said, something else that struck me in the course of this research is that I think, and, and it's a theme, and it's not out of any disrespect. I wrote, you know, I mean, I have infinite respect for uh, former Prime Minister Lee. Um, but it does seem to me the story is considerably bigger than that. Um, of course, members of the old guard that are not so well known outside of uh, Singapore. Uh, and I know some of you have written on Gokang Si, for example. Uh, the Arsis has a recent, a good recent book, for example, on that, on him. Uh, he's, he's one of the very remarkable people. Uh, Foreign Minister Rajaratnam, obviously, uh, was another. Um, 
So there's that. There's the, 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 and then there's the various generations of leaders that you've had. But also, it seems to me, the quality of the civil service, the way that that has been uh, selected, the or organizational side, the institutional side, things that go far beyond uh, simply uh, one, one individual. It's not as great as one leader was. It's not a matter only of that. Of course, it interrelates to that. There are things like the PPS system and uh, Prime Minister Lee himself, I think, trained and, and, and picked some of the important figures that have been so remarkable in, in the history that came after. But they, it's much bigger than that. It's much bigger than any one individual. Um, EPB, for example, I did uh, uh, some work on that, and it seems to me both in its institutional, its institutional design, its global sweep, the statutory boards, generally speaking, the way that they finesse what, well, I'm a Japan specialist, what is an endemic problem in Japanese public policy recently of being, um, you know, beholden to the politicians so that one can be more strategic and um, avoid clientelism that tends to not, if not totally avoid it, at least to some extent be insulated from it. Uh, and also take advantage of the uh, interaction with the private sector. That, it seems to me, is another probably one of the strengths of, of EDB, as well as its, its global uh, reach. Um, technology uh, is another important um, dimension here. The world has changed so rapidly in technological terms. And especially the kind of approach of having engineers and people who understand technology and then applying and using um, that knowledge internationally. Crimson Logic, for example, in which I did a little case study was a, an interesting uh, case in point, it seemed to me. E-government. You've done an awfully lot uh, with e-government. And... Um, that is, uh, and then you turn that into an export industry. M my son was over in Oman recently and noting that uh, Crimson Logic, for example, is consulting on e-government in Oman right now. Um, I, uh, let me just go re ra briefly through these, uh, particularly into uh, the s smart city. I was talking about that and then the idea of smart state. Uh, there's this broad epic uh, urbanization across the industrialized world, uh, indu the uh, industrializing world that I mentioned. There's where I think a lot of the opportunities exist and that Singapore has been taking advantage of, uh, especially sort of in these middle range cities that have not developed yet uh, so that there is not a proliferation of Jakartas and Manilas and I mean, not to, in no disrespect to those particular places, but urban sprawl, and we've had that too, is something uh, that, you know, no doubt would be good to avoid. And city planning can play a role there. Land management, transportation, the ERP, uh, or EP, uh, electronic load pricing, yeah. ER, ERP uh, system, for example. Land management, using land as a way to holistically relate, um, you know, industrial issues, uh, housing issues, and so on. Um, and also uh, using this to reduce environmental problems. One thing I'm always struck by, just ca I just came from Tokyo, and, um, you know, get just getting around town, I think, is eas a lot easier. Um, d you be it ERP, be it just the way the roads are constructed, be it also the way industry and housing are configured. I think that's a key uh, part of the fact that you've been relatively able to avoid, uh, you know, urban sprawl and um, pollution in, in various ways. Parks, housing, uh, high-rise housing more than, um, you know, just individual homes. The contrast to me to Tokyo, for example, are quite striking. Um, 
Now, how about on the other? As I said, at the macro national level, it seems to me things, I call this minimalist government. I did a piece for the uh, Wall Street Journal uh, years ago called Japan's uh, Minimalist Government. It was about uh, METI and, you know, the small bureaucracy with broad functions, that sort of an idea. It seems to me that is, has been quite common in, in Singapore uh, as well. Uh, public expenditures over GDP are relatively small. This is partly because of the statutory boards. I mean, some of this is a, is a f sort of f uh, a statistical matter. I, I think one uh, has to admit that, that you have functions that ought in the statutory boards, quite a large number of important functions that would be government, um, um, on the government budget directly in other countries. But your share of GDP that is accounted by uh, government is small. Um, and the workforce here, take Britain for example, about 16% of the workforce in the government. In Singapore, about uh, four and it was about 5%. Uh, Prime Minister Lee once said, Singapore cannot be Britain, remember that. And of course, over the years, some would say, with no disrespect, would you really want to be <laughs> Britain? <laughs> um, one of the areas, of course, uh, where there was, has been that sort of proliferation was in public employment, especially from the 50s and 60s. Um, the welfare state challenge, um, this is an area where Singapore, there's has been, has had a different approach. I don't, a lot of this you know so well, I don't really want to spend too much time on, but the approach generally I see as minimalist and enabling. Minimalist in the sense of, and that can be taken negatively, in the sense of a basic level of, of um, you know, broad, broad, broad entitlements but with a minimum level of expenditure. Um, and then supplementing that with various kinds of sort of pay-as-you-go or self-help type programs, especially with uh, in housing. Um, so that is, and the CPF, I worked on Central Provident Fund in the first book that I did, you know, 30 years ago. And it's, it has continued to interest me as a, a rather unusual sort of system but one that uh, prob so for sure is relevant to some of the emerging nations and I think in some ways may be um, relevant to the, the uh, G7 as well. Um, I go into some detail on this without getting into the specifics. This interested me. Coverage, and I think this is one of the key points here, Singapore. Coverage as a percentage of the eligible population, it's quite high. You see it over here with, uh, well, there's socialist China, long-time socialist. South Korea uh, may have gone even further out, but um, very high coverage, but with spending per beneficiary as a percentage of GP GDP being relatively low. Look at Malaysia, a small percentage of the population covered about 15, but with spending up here at uh, very, very high. Malaysia and Singapore are in a dramatically uh, different position there. I think uh, this is seems to be, to pervade Singapore's uh, welfare policies as far as I can see. But housing again, um, six, 70, 80 percent of residents living in public housing and 90 percent of them owning their homes. Um, pluralism. Ethnic pluralism in Singapore is greater than in um, most, uh, it's, it's obviously not hom homogeneous. Here's Japan almost totally, or even China. Um, it's less so, and yet uh, you've dramatically reduced the amount of uh, ethnic conflict, <coughs> diversity, education. Here's a, this was a striking difference. Singapore, over 20% of government spending on education. Japan is about 10. 
the United States. And, and uh, we, of course, both, I think it's fair to say, especially at the university level, they have fine systems. You spend even more of your budget on education. The other one, well, the location, which is obvious. This one interested me, defense spending. Singapore almost up with the United States. As a, um, and I, it interested me that uh, Singapore's spending on, uh, on defense is higher than uh, that of, of Vietnam, for example, and by a significant margin is the highest in, in Southeast Asia. And I don't think the contribution on security in various ways is lost, certainly on several uh, former colleagues or friends uh, working in the U.S. government, too, that always used to stress that were uh, Kurt Campbell and Ezra Vogel, for example. Um, this idea of Singapore as a global hub interests me a lot. Catalyst for ideas and action, foreign investment. You know, and some of these things have just they've really begun there, uh, to accelerate since uh, the beginning of the 21st century. And there's where I think the synergies between the rise of China and India and Singapore uh, are really quite striking. Uh, I went up to uh, One North, for example. These, you know, Fusionopolis, Biopolis, these kind of ideas. Uh, another thing that I looked into, and I, I visited several of these places up in China as well, for example, Suzhou. Uh, the evolution of your, uh, your, your projects, they're sort of, uh, again, micro. To me, the, the micro, uh, you know, pilot projects that have broader relevance, what you've done in developing countries in that regard seems to me very important. Suzhou, manufacturing-oriented, then Shenzhen, which is much more eco-oriented. And now, the most recent, which really interests me, is the Chongqing project, when uh, President Xi uh, came here to Singapore, I guess, the end of 2015, relating to Internet of Things and logistics. In some other work I've been doing, I've been looking at uh, the transportation networks across Eurasia, and the uh, intermodal uh, transportation, if you shift from rail to road or from road to rail to air to river, you know, and move back and forth between all of those, it's rather complex and it can be a costly process. But Singapore has done uh, tremendous innovations in that area. You know, it support, uh, your port authority, for example, shows a lot of that. So. So that's an interesting place to end up, it seems to me. <laughs> Probably not the end, but, um, well, very appropriately in coming to the end. Um, I guess I would just summarize. I haven't gotten into the foreign policy, and there's a fair amount of this book that deals with diplomacy and the ability to deal broadly with many different groups and, um, you know, to be able to deal with the Arab world and the, G the um, group of 77 is the way Raja Ratnam did, and then also to deal with Israel at the same time and, you know, get their expertise on defense issues, as you did. I could go into a lot of those uh, questions, except that some people know all of this so much better than I. It would be presumptuous of me, really, to talk about that. But I think you provide some remarkable uh, cases, and I, if there's, I have any aspiration for this book, other than just to get people to think and to understand a little more about Singapore, it's that it might be involved in comparative public policy courses, and that we should, you know, the public policy schools of the world would be looking more uh, at Singapore for what it says about smart cities, what it says about smart states in the sense of reconfiguring uh, national governments, and what it says about global hubs and the ability to be a convener that can, you know, bring people from different parts of the world together. So that's basically what I had to say, and I look forward to your comments.
Well, thank you, Ken, for a very comprehensive survey of, of, of the book. Uh, so you've heard it, uh, go buy it. Uh, but before we do that, we just want to invite Tech Boon to share some thoughts. Good afternoon, Si Seng. Professor Ken Calder, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. It is my privilege and pleasure to be here today, but I have to admit, I hesitated for a while when I was asked to be the discussant today. I'll give you the PG-rated version of my initial reaction. <laughs> it goes along the line of, oh dear, what am I supposed to say for 15 minutes? It is not that the topic of smart city is alien to me. I've studied it for several years. But the fact is, Professor Calder is such a towering figure in the academic world. He received his PhD from Harvard when I was still in diapers. He has 12 mm -hmm. books under his belt, um, published numerous journal articles, and taught countless numbers of students. I remember reading his foreign affairs article, The New Face of Northeast Asia, when I was just an undergraduate in the US. Mm. So that was my concern. What more can I possibly add to Singapore smart city, smart state, that's even half worthwhile to Professor Calder? So now you can understand the reason behind my trepidation and hesitancy. But ultimately, I got around it. It is my great honor to be called upon to discuss this amazing book. And I was not about to let something so worthy slip by. Still, I had to think of something meaningful to say today. After ruminating for a while, what I'm, what I'm going to say today, I decided to speak straight from my heart and hope for the best. Mm -hmm. What makes Singapore successful despite facing an assortment of constraints? The answer to this vastly complex question can be found in this wonderful book here. Don't be fooled by its somewhat innocuous cover. It sure packs a punch and contains tremendously valuable insights from the, into the intricate workings of this country, as well, the, as well as a highly efficient government that runs it. Carefully tracing the modern history of Singapore from the end of World War II to present day, Professor Calder unpacks and discuss in detail what effectively transformed this backwater British colony to the first world country that it is today. Equally important, Professor Calder presents his finding in a clear and intuitive manner that readers of all levels of sophistication will have no difficulties appreciating this deeply insightful book, even though it covers an immensely complex subject matter. Before you start asking, what is the big deal with the Singapore story? I want to draw your attention to page 35 of this book, in which Professor Calder wrote, I quote, when Singapore gained independence on August 9, 1965, the PAP government had to contend with high unemployment, a housing crisis, Indonesia's confrontasi, and a deepening challenge from communist unions, not to mention the rapidly expanding Vietnam conflict. Then on page 164, Professor Calder adds, historically, this nation was born in a tough neighborhood in a tough time. Amidst the Vietnam War, enduring ethnic disorder, Britain's withdrawal from the east of Suez, and the two oil shocks in the first few years of statehood. Geoeconomically, this is a nation devoid of both resources and manpower in a region with a surplus of both. By the way, I would like to add that in 1965, you saw from the chart just now, in 1965, our per capita GDP was only about 500 US dollars, equivalent to those of Mexico and South, America, South Africa. Furthermore, I was told recently at another book launch that corruption was so deeply rooted and rampant in 1959 that you had to bribe the ambulance driver to take you to the hospital if you're sick or injured. Mm. We do not remember those things today, but corruption was that bad then. Today, Singapore ranks high on many fronts. Its per capita GDP ranks 9 out of 248 countries, outstripping that of Britain, Germany, Japan, and even the US. Its foreign exchange and gold reserves rank 11 highest of 84 nations. The technical quality of its healthcare system has been ranked third best in the world, and the infant mortality rate is the second lowest globally. It has a consistently high quality educational system from kindergarten to university, and corruption is virtually non-existent today. So by most measure, Singapore's success is, is clearly no trivial feat. But how Singapore did it is less clear, at least until now. This book has, one might argue, solved this no small puzzle. I can give you a thumbnail sketch of the answer given by Professor Calder, but if you want the full details, then I'm sorry, you will have to buy his book, which I strongly <laughs> recommend that you do. 
<laughs> According to Professor Calder, the key to Singapore's success rests with the country's ability to act concurrently as a smart state as well as a smart city. Specifically, the state is smart because it is minimalist and enabling. To be precise, the state is smart because it is pragmatic, responsive, and technologically sophisticated enough to facilitate the smooth operation of the country in a highly uncertain global environment. Meanwhile, the city is smart because of its innovative and holistic approach to urban management, where individual sector-specific <coughs> policies like those in transportation, land use, housing, and the environment are woven into a systematically integrated approach. The Singapore sy systematic approach in the last 30 years to transform the country into an intelligent island, a smart nation with the latest high-tech ICT, information communication technology, internet of things and smart city technology speaks to this holistic approach. Apart from, ec from economic development, this high-tech drive is designed to enhance Singapore's competitiveness, transparency, efficiency and connectivity. The outcome is a smart city that is not only livable, but also features quality housing, high income ownership, and impressive innovation in resource management and environmental protection. In addition, Professor Calder lists two other specific contexts that make Singapore smart and successful. But as I've mentioned earlier, you have to buy his book and read it <laughs> to find out for yourself what they are. I want to stress that giving this book a miss will be a mi big mistake because it holds valuable lessons and insights not just for emerging economies looking to catch up with the West, but for advanced economies struggling with derages <coughs> and crisis. In many ways, by unpacking the Singapore experience, Professor Calder has given us a clear and distinct roadmap for effective governance, one that world leaders looking to improve the lives of their people can follow. This is arguably the most important contribution <coughs> of this piece of work. It is, however, worth pointing out couple of minor imperfections of this book. Okay. Certainly theories has been submitted in the past postulating the reasons behind Singapore's success, the best example of which is a combined sense of pragmatism, meritocracy and honesty that is embedded not just in the operations of the highly efficient bureaucracy but also the psyche of policy makers. Dean Kishor Mabubani of the, of the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy in particular has alluded to this set of principle of meritocracy, pragmatism and honesty, the last being the most difficult to nurture on quite a few occasions. To strengthen his central thesis that Singapore's success was due primarily to it being a smart city state, Professor Calder can perhaps account for competing theories such as the one just underlined. I know he did weave meritocracy and honesty as important elements into his book, but perhaps you can discuss why he saw pragmatism as the key. Speaking of pragmatism, let me dwell on it a little bit more. Uh, the concept of pragmatism is closely associated with the American philosopher Charles Saunders Peirce, who defined pragmatism as, let me put it in, in broad terms, believing in or acting on information that the community of Noah has agreed to be accurate. Another somewhat analogous interpretation of pragmatism is given by William James, also an American philosopher. He defines it as believing in or acting on information based on the practical cash value that can be, der that can be derived from it. While Peirce's conception of pragmatism is closely associated with the scientific method, James' version of it is more closely related to what is commonly called cost-benefit analysis. As you can probably guess from this two parallel conception, Pragmatism is a very difficult governance principle that requires great care and, and deep thinkers to operationalize despite its apparent straightforward theme. Otherwise, it, ris it risks turning into what Singaporean academic Kenneth Paul Tan calls uncritical pragmatism, a situation whereby anything goes to achieve a narrow, poorly thought out, and limited set of human goals. Is this a real danger when countries attempt to replicate the Singapore success story? I believe so. Thanks to Russia and the FBI, we'll soon have a US president that epitomizes this worrisome attitude of uncritical pragmatism, where anything goes. According to Trump, if Mexicans are unsavory, then, build, then a wall should be built to keep them out. And for those already in the US, mass deportation is on the table. 
I hope he's just joking, for this line of thinking reflects the ultimate corruption of pragmatism as a tried and tested principle of governance. Mm -hmm. So yes, pragmatism has worked well for Singapore, but how might other countries that would like to replicate the Singapore model guard against its, worst, its own worst enemy, uncritical pragmatism? What can be done to ensure that, do not, that, they, do not come, that they do not become too smart in the pursuit of smartness? But of course, these two points are minor imperfections and merely distraction to what is overall a wonderful book. Anyone looking for a refreshing and well-substantiated position on the secret to Singapore's success will definitely find Singapore, smart city, smart state, highly, innovate, highly inf informative and deeply insightful. Thoroughly researched and well-written, it tells a very compelling story and is a real gem. Anyone looking to understand Singapore, its past, present and future, and indeed how countries of various sizes should be run, this enormously important piece of work is a definite must read. Thank you.